that any better? Oh, there we go. Woo! Software is hard, as you can see. Hardware, too. So last year, I had the um, personal pleasure of celebrating 10 years of working with Ruby and 10 years of working with Rails. But this year, I have a much more interesting anniversary, which is 10 years of sharing Ruby on Rails with all of you and everyone who's been using it over the past decade. Um, the picture in the background is actually from almost exactly this time where I gave the very first presentation on Ruby on Rails at a Danish university uh, 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, I had to talk a lot about what is MVC, for example. Um, today, not so much. There's a lot of the things that over the past 10 years, um, things we worried about in the beginning, sort of leveling up as a community and as, as programmers, that just aren't relevant anymore. We're just taking all that stuff for granted, which is awesome. We get to care about a lot of other stuff. Um, but as I look back over the past 10 years, which is pretty much the majority of my adult life, I've been working on Ruby on Rails. Um, it's fun to look back even further. I think there's a common misconception that anybody who ends up creating something like Rails or, or doing something else within software development or computer science, well, they must have been programming since they were five years old, right? I, the whole notion of, uh, of a hacker is somebody who, who sort of got their first computer um, uh, 20 years ago and was just programming the entire time. Well, that wasn't me. I did not learn to program when I was five years old. Um, I didn't learn to program until I was closer to 20. Um, I'd been interested in computers for a long time, but it wasn't really until the late 90s, early 2000s, that I dove into computer programming as something that I was going to do. I had a lot of friends who were doing it. I knew a lot of programmers. But um, somehow it, um, it sort of never, never caught on. Um, before I started writing software that I needed for myself, and before I found sort of a place in the software world for that to happen. And the reason I, I say that is, is I've seen a, a number of essays on like, what is a true hacker? And, and as a true hacker, um, one of the things that keeps being thrown out is those 10 years, right? You should have been programming for 10 years already, otherwise you're way behind. Well, I learned to program about three years before I released Ruby on Rails. Turned out fine. Um, and I don't say that, it's like, it was because I grew up on a farm and didn't know what a computer was. Um, this is me in, in the center there with the stick and the, the blue shirt in uh, 1985. These are the kids that were living uh, in my neighborhood. And in 1985, I got introduced to my, my first computer. And um, I was about five years old. And I got introduced to computers through gaming. Sort of, we were playing ninjas in the streets around our houses, and then we'd play ninjas on the box. And I found that fascinating right from the get-go, right? Um, computers were really fascinating, and, and games really captured my imagination early on. Um, I remember at that time, there were certainly lots of parents who were like, well, make sure you get out and play a lot, um, because you don't want to spend your, or wasting your time, that was, the, that was the word, wasting your time in front of computers inside, right? Well, I really did want to waste my time in front of computers. And this was the computer to have in 1985 in our sort of neighborhood. But we couldn't afford a computer like that. There was only one guy in the whole neighborhood that had a computer like that. So we all shared it, and we all played Yi Kung Fu in turn. Um, but then the next year, so I, I couldn't afford this computer, but um, my dad somehow he was fixing TVs and stereos. He traded a stereo with this guy for this other weird computer, which was an Amstrad uh, 646. And I was really excited. It didn't actually play Yi Kung Fu. I was a little disappointed about that, but it had some other crappier games. Anyway, it was a computer. And that was sort of my first introduction to, um, to computers, six years old. And, um, and I tried to learn programming. 
I, um, I got a magazine, and at the back of these magazines back then, there were programs you could type in. I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. I can control this computer. So I built my first information technology system. It was um, messages to my mom of where I went, where I had this clever system that I would really optimize the fact that um, writing a message of where I went and, and when I was going to be home, it was too complicated. It would be much easier if I just wrote a little note where I gave her the um, location on the tape that she had to fast forward to, and then she could read where I was. I thought, man, this is so clever. I just have to write down 228, and then I could pre-program that note, and she'll know I was over at Peter's house playing Year Kung Fu. Um, that really wasn't programming, right? I just typed some stuff in. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just somehow figured out print, okay, that puts stuff up on the screen. That was, that was the extent of it, right? But it was my first step at, at programming, and, and I, it kind of failed. Like, that was the extent of my, my program, that I, I knew how to fast forward to a pre-recorded message. Um, not that great. So, a couple years later, late 80s, um, I saw this game for the first time, Battle Squadron. And I remember thinking, holy shit, these graphics are amazing. How can they make this? This looks so good. When you were um, used to our Commodore 64, the, the graphics of the Amiga 500 which is mind-blowing, right? And once again, I felt this like, Wow, wouldn't it be amazing to be part of that, to be able to create something like that? I'd love to make games. So I sort of started looking around, and, uh, and I found this thing called uh, Amos. I don't know, have anybody here ever programmed an Amos? Not a single hand. OK, must have been a very European thing. Um, but it was sort of a real programming environment, and, and I got the box, and sort of my English was a little not that great, so I was sort of just reading through it and trying to find the code, and it was all about sprites and vectors and ifs and variables, and it, it didn't make any sense to me at all. So I thought, eh, this is a little bit too hard. Thankfully, there was something called Easy Amos, right? Oh, wow, that's going to be great. This other one was too hard, now I just have to do the easy one. Um, unfortunately, in Easy Amos, it was still programming, and it still had conditionals and variables and all these other things I just did not understand. I, it's so funny, because once you learn something, it can sometimes be hard to go back and think, like, how was it before I knew how to do this? But I distinctly remember, why would you have a variable? Like, if you just assign something once, why would you ever sort of want to change that? Why does it have to be a space? Why can't it just be the thing? Like, I did not get the concept of variables. And this is at, I don't know, age 10 or whatever. So still not getting programming. It's, it's still not making any sense to me. Um, so I gave up on that, too. Um, then in 1993, I went to um, something called The Gathering, The Gathering 3, which was a, a big demo party in Denmark where people from all over Europe, maybe some from the US as well, would gather to, to show off their skills of creating these demos. And demos were basically just like little music videos with computer graphics. And I thought that was really awesome. And again, I got this sensation of, Wow, that's amazing. People are creating these sequences. They look really good. This is, this is awesome. I'd love to be a part of that. This is 93, so I'm, I'm 14. At this demo party, I then I met pretty much everybody I knew for the next 10 years in, in, um, in computer software, including um, Alan of TextMate fame. I was 14, and he was part of one of these demo groups. And uh, um, we got talking, and then 10 years later, um, um, I'd help him release TextMate, and this is now 20 years ago. Um, anyway, I still didn't get the concept, right? Like, it was all, it was assembler, so it was even harder and weirder to figure out than, um, than Amos was. Um, it was vectors, it was math, it was, it was just really hard. So once again, this is the third time I tried to sort of figure out programming because I want to build stuff, and the third time it failed. So I ended up building another information system. At that time, there's something called um, BBSs. So uh, pre-internet, you dialed up to basically every website individually through a modem, and I ran one of those things. Um, at that time, it was uh, what was called a Wares BBS, which was where we traded all the illegal software that we couldn't afford, and games and demos. Um, and I had a lot of fun doing that. I was 
15 and I was uh, working at a grocery store and I spent all my money buying modems and phone lines. Um, but sort of the long of the short of this is that I failed to identify with programming under the computer science paradigm. Computer science in itself just didn't really appeal to me. Like it didn't make sense to me. Um, learning programming through sort of the lens, the prism of, of hard science, just, it didn't really, it just didn't click. And I was actually pretty disappointed for a while. Like I tried to learn programming three or four times over the past 10 years of my, my life, and it just, it wasn't clicking. Um, no surprise to uh, sort of my teachers. This is my high school diploma part of it, and it says math, final exam, F. And, and English, I got an A. But math was just never my thing. Physics never, was never my thing. Um, any of the hard sciences were just never my thing. And you say, oh, well, that explains a lot. That's why Rails is so fucking slow. Um, <laughs> But it, it, it's true. It just never appealed to me. But I think it also inoculated me with something really early on, which was it disabused me of the thinking that I was a computer scientist, that I was ever going to come up with an algorithm, that I was ever going to make any groundbreaking um, discoveries at the low level of, of computer science. And that was actually really a relief. Because when I finally got into programming, I knew that that was just not what I was going to do. That was never, it wasn't my idol. It was not what I was chasing. Um, I wanted to build information systems. Like all these attempts I had over the years, they were all about information systems. They were about using the computer to build something else that really didn't have much to do with the underlying things. Um, that there were people, smart people, who had come up with algorithms underneath to, to make it all work. Wonderful. I'm not one of them. And that's fine. I think, as an industry, um, very few people have gotten to that realization, even if it is that they, on a daily basis, build information system. Even if it is that they're working on yet another social network for sock puppets or horror, in my case, yet another fucking to-do list, um, the aspiration of the whole industry, everyone in it, is that we're all programmers, right? No, we're not. I am nothing like Linus, right? He's actually a real computer scientist. To figure out how to, I don't know, fucking improve the scheduler and the kernel, whoosh. <laughs> no clue, no interest, all good. I am ever in debt that there are people like that out there who can do this stuff. So I don't have to do it. So I can focus on something else. But I think most programmers think that, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Yeah, I work in information systems, but like, we're kind of colleagues, right? Me and Linus here. Um, I'm pretty sure that he would tell you, fuck you. <laughs> we're nothing alike. We are not colleagues. What you do is making another fucking to-do list. I'm improving the fucking kernel of Linux. Um, far more important work. He would disabuse you of your delusions of grandeur real quick. Um, and I think that's a real shame. I think it's a real shame that if you sort of pick your heroes in such an impossible fashion, that they're actually nothing like you, and you will be nothing like them, you're going to set yourself up for a bad time for the whole ride. The truth of the matter is that most information system development has very little to do with science. Yes, it's all built on top of computer science. Yes, computer science is what makes it possible for us to do what it is that we do. Um, but it doesn't define what we do. And I think in many ways, that prism of computer science is harmful to the development of information systems. It's actually not a good view on the world to have. Just because you can make your Steinway and Sons and you can make the best piano in the world, that doesn't make you a great pianist. It doesn't mean you can play a wonderful tune. Just because you can create the foundations of which other people can build upon, just because you're a great computer scientist, 
doesn't mean you're a great software writer. Doesn't mean you're a great programmer of information systems. And most of all, if you are committed to building information systems, and I am wholly committed to building information systems, I've given up the notion long ago that I was going to get into games programming or vector programming or anything else that sounds like hard science and is hard. Um, I think you're going to be much better off. But I think it's also really tough because I think most of the paths, the celebrated paths into programming, go through co courses called computer science. So you're sort of taught right from the get go that computer science, like that is the ultimate ideal. And what you're doing here is just sort of piddling along until you can get to this top of the mountain. Um, even worse, if you actually have a degree in computer science, right? And now you're slumming it with that yet another social network or yet another fucking to-do list. I mean, that's a recipe for self-loathing if I have a new one. But as I say, this is mostly about the prism of how you're looking at programming. What is programming? What is writing software? What is it that we do every day when we create information systems? And if you look at it from this prism of the hard sciences, um, you think, well, law of thermodynamics, physics, this is, this is the real serious hard stuff, right? You will laugh of French poetry. <laughs> They're all just, what, analyzing what some schmuck in the 1700s did, and there's a thousand different interpretations of, of what that person actually wrote and what does that actually mean? Like, that's pathetic, right? You can't arrive at any ultimate, clear, universal truth. Math, there's a truth. There's a final result. Physics, there's a truth. We're knowing more about the natural world in a way where we can be completely confident, mostly, in what we know, certainly in math, right? If you carry that over into programming, um, you end up with shit like this. Law of the meter. Practices and principles who sort of project that they're universal truths about the natural world, that this is how good programs are made, and this is not really an argument. The only argument is whether you're a professional and following the laws, or you're an amateur and you're breaking them. When I look at computer programming, and when I reach most read most programs, I'm not reading hard sciences. It is much more like studying 17th century French poetry. What the fuck did this guy mean? Like, I can't follow this at all. Like, is this some weird reference to some play somewhere? What's going on here? It's actually more like forensics. It's more like analysis. It's much more subjective. Like, what is actually going on? What were they trying to communicate? What are, what's just going on here, right? Um, so I just, I find it so funny that the programmers who work in programming and they laugh of all these subjective fields of, of endeavor when that is what they do every day. They just, no, what I'm doing is computer science. This is empirical truth, blah, blah, blah. We have laws, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think the, the bottom line of that is when you go in with that notion, when you go in with the notion that we can actually discover laws of programming, like law of the meter of how we should be creating our programs, you lull yourself into this belief that there are some practices that are just true. They're not up for debate, not up for discussion. Um, they're science, that what we do is science. Well, I think there's another word for sort of those delusions. Um, pseudoscience. When people think they're doing science, and they're not actually doing science. That's pseudoscience. I think a lot of what's going on in software methodology, practices, um, is pseudoscience. Which would be fine if people would accept that and say, yes, what I'm doing is pseudoscience. Like, I'm, I'm not finding any grand truth here, but they're not, right? They're expounding that this is, this is the truth. Well, here's another pseudoscience. Uh, diet schemes. I think diets are actually incredibly similar to most uh, software methodology approaches. Um, they all sort of expose that I have the truth. 
What you need to get slim and healthy is the 10-day green smoothie cleanse. That is the truth. That's how you get it, right? And then you look, oh shit, so that, that's, okay, smoothies, sounds, sounds good. But what about this super shred diet? Like, I lose 20 pounds in four weeks? That's certainly better than 10 pounds in, I don't know, 10 weeks or whatever that hungry diet girl is promising. I'll go with that super shred guy. Like, he's got to have the truth, right? And it's so funny, if you read any diet books, the diet books are incredibly popular. If you look at the most popular book on Amazon, the top 100 list, a lot of them are diet books. People want to be told um, how they can cheat the basics. I think software development is exactly like that. I think software developers are exactly like people trying to lose 10 pounds and thinking, you know what, all this exercising, just eating healthier, that's a little too hard. Let's, let's listen to this super shred guy. He's got to have the answer. An answer that's less painful, less simple and basic. Um, there's got to be some grand secret I just don't know yet. If I can just learn the secret, then everything's going to be great, right? But it's pseudoscience. Most diets are based on anecdotes. They're based on one guy trying something or looking at a few people, a tiny sample size. It's just pure, poor. Pure, poor science. Um, external variables, con uncontrolled experience that run for too long. You can't derive any absolute truths from it, but people keep arriving at absolute truths. Um, and just like feeling a little overweight, and most people do at some point in their life, everybody wants to lose whatever it is. They want to feel healthier, even if they are at the correct weight. They want to be in better shape. Um, all our code bases are exactly like that. Everyone has like, oh, I'd love that this part of the code base is not that clean, right? So we have that same feeling of being a little insecure about our quote, code quality, just like most people are a little insecure, at least at certain times in their life, about their body, right? So we're ripe for somebody to come in and tell us what's wrong, to fix it for us by just saying, oh, no, 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 you don't have to do any of the hard stuff. Writing good code, do you know what that's about? It's about this one practice, this one secret that they don't want you to know. If I teach you that, then all your code is going to be wonderful. But right now, you're not a professional. You're an amateur. You're writing dirty code. You should feel really bad about that. You have sinned. But I will give you absolution. I have the pathway um, to clean code. And it hits a lot of people right in the imposter plexus. Like, ugh, you're saying my code is dirty? Yeah, I guess it is a little dirty. There's this one part that's like, shit, maybe I'm not really a computer scientist. Maybe I, doesn't really, I don't really belong here amongst the programmers. Can you please tell me, how do I get to be a computer scientist? How can I, I get to belong amongst the esteemed professional programmers. Can you tell me how? And there are lots of people willing to tell you how. That the salvation will come through these patterns and practices, and as long as you follow these 10 commandments of good code, all shall be well. Okay. I think the most popular commandment, I'm gonna spend some time on that, the most popular practice, the most popular pattern, for making fee people feel shitty about their code and shitty about themselves and shitty about their path through programming <laughs> is TDD. TDD is the most successful software diet of all times. <laughs> it's so alluring. It has such an appeal in its basic principles that everyone gets wrapped up in it. I got wrapped up in it for quite a while. I got wrapped up in the storytelling that all software before TDD was shit and unprofessional. And that the only way to arrive at clean code was to follow the principles of TDD. And the principles of TDD, mind you, are not about the tests. It's about test first. It's about test driven design, right? That we have tests afterwards, that's just an accidental side effect, a benefit. 
if you will, after the fact. And it's the perfect diet. I tried multiple times, which is usually how it goes with diets. You try one and it doesn't really work and you fall off the wagon and then a few months later you try again and you feel bad about it the whole time and, and that's how I felt about TDD for a long time. I felt like TDD was what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to write all my tests first and then I would be allowed to write my code. And it just didn't work. I kept just feeling like this is not, I'm not arriving at something better here. When I'm driving my design by writing my tests first, the code I look at afterwards, it's not better. It's not cleaner. The dirty code I wrote without being test written first, it actually looks better. But so successful has TDD been that for the longest time, until actually fairly recently, I just thought, well, I'm the, wrong doing, I'm the one doing it wrong. TDD is not at fault, right? Just because everybody's doing TDD wrong doesn't mean that there's no anything wrong with TDD. There's just something wrong with all of you. And that's the problem. If you would just be more faithful to the practices, then everything would be great. And that's what makes it such a great diet, that it keeps people in the perpetual state of feeling inadequate. So you keep having to buy more books and attend more conference talks and attend more workshops and hire more consultants to teach you to be truer to the religion of TDD. Hog wash. Let's look at some code. So here's a very simple piece of code. Um, person has an age method that calculates how old some, somebody is. Uh, and we have a test for it. This piece of code depends on the world. It directly refers to date today. It's an explicit dependency. You cannot change it in there. Well, in a lot of languages, that's a problem. Like, how are you actually going to test this if you can't somehow figure out how to change the date of today? Like, every time you run your test, it might be a different day and, and it might be broken. Well, in Ruby, it's really easy. We just stop that constant and make it work. That's what the travel to method is about, right? Proponents of TDD will look at that code and say, dirty, dirty code. Explicit dependencies hidden inside. You're mocking a global object? What the fuck? <laughs> you need to shave up. Here's the shaped up version. We inject our dependency, so we have a default of date today, but we can put in our own in the test. We can put in our own date, right? This is much cleaner. Like, no, oh, great. We improved our code base. Did we? Is this a better code base? Is this method better than what we just had there? Is it simpler? Is it clearer? No. It's easier to test. And that's the important point, right? That's the important point in all these debates. It's just, is it easier to test? That's the measure of success. I think that's a shitty measure of success. I think there are much higher ideals than just whether something is easy to test. But it gets worse. Here's another example. If you actually have a method that depends on another method, where you have to de inject the dependency all the way down, now you're really muddying things up. And now the code is really starting to get nasty. And this is such a simple example. I've actually posted this example online before and had arguments with TDD proponents about that. And yes, this is similar. Like, well, what does it matter? You're just injecting one dependency. What does it matter? It's not that big of a deal, right? Yes, it is. Because this is exactly the type of thinking that leads you down a really nasty path. Let's look at another example. Here's the standard Rails controller. It has reliance on the world. It relies on a, a before action that ensures permissions. It sets up a, um, a new object and sends out an email and then it responds to something, right? The whole purpose of the controller in Rails is to sort of direct the world. It's to interact with the world. But how do you unit test that, right? That's really hard. It's relying on the entire world. If we're following this scientific approach of unit testing where we are isolating all variables, holding everything else constant except for these two things. What goes in, what comes out, this is bad, right? If we instead put in something like a person creation command and hide away all the actual doing of the controller and then we inject all the stuff that it depends on, we can test person creation command really well. Is that code better? Is that code simpler? Is it clearer? 
Would you rather look at this and then understand what the system does, or would you rather look at this and try to figure out where does this thing go? And I think that that's the consequence of this chase of test first. It leads it down a path where the gospel of test-driven design is that anything that's easier to test is better. That's it. That's the measure of quality. If you can test it easily, it's better. If you can't test it easily, it's worse. Boo. Exactly right. Boo. It's not better. And we're losing sight of what we're actually trying to do. Tests were supposed to support us. They weren't supposed to be the main thing. And I think this is leading to a lot of uh, zombie astronautic architectures. Things that I thought we moved past long ago. If you look at, at this person create command, that reminds me very much about struts 1.2 and how they had every action as their own object. And that was great because that was easy to test. And it was shit when you were trying to put a whole architecture together because you had all these create commands and all of a sudden you had a million objects. Yes, they were easy to test, but the system was much harder to reason about. You see the same thing around active record, for example. You see, well, active records should just be uh, data access objects. They shouldn't actually have any logic. They should just be about interfacing with the database because then we can split out everything else, our domain logic, such that it doesn't have to touch the database, such that our test can be simple, such that our test can be fast, right? Again, order of priority. Test, test fast. Oh, your architecture. That'll, that'll just fall from that, right? I recently read uh, James Copeland um, has a great white paper out called Why Most Unit Testing is Waste. And for me, this is the money co quote. Splitting up functions to support the testing process destroys your system architecture and code comprehension along with it. Test at a coarser level of granularity. Um, TDD is focused on the unit. The unit is the sacred piece because that's the science piece. That's where we can control all of the variables. We're just looking at these few pieces, right? What James is saying is maybe that's not the right level. Maybe testing, the role it should have, shouldn't be about the unit most of the time. And I sort of alluded to this uh, a while back. I wrote a, a post called um, Testing Like the TSA. And the main thing about that was about over-testing and sort of this testing theater that goes on. But I hadn't really made the switch that it, the problem is that we're trying to test at the wrong level. It's not testing itself. Testing is great. I'm not advocating that we shouldn't have tests. I'm advocating that driving your design from unit tests is actually not a good idea. That you actually end up destroying your system architecture and your code comprehension along with it. So, if unit tests aren't the thing, what could we do instead? Well, I think there are higher levels of testing. We've already sort of moved to that in Rails. It's no longer called test unit where you place your, your test. It's called test models. That's already one step up. That sort of frees you from feeling bad about the fact that your, your model tests actually touch the database, that that's not a bad thing. Yes, they run slower, but they also test more things. You can make anything fast if it doesn't have to work. <laughs> and I think that's the problem with testing a lot of the cases. We recently had a really bad bug on Basecamp where we actually lost some data for real customers, and it was incredibly well tested at the unit level. And all the tests passed, and still we lost data. How the fuck did that happen? It happened because we were so focused on driving our design from the unit test level we didn't have any system tests for that particular thing. And it was a really simple thing. It was like if you were editing uh, an object and you were editing the attachments, you could lose an attachment. And we lost some attachments, and it was a terrible thing. And after that, sort of thought, wait a minute, all these unit tests are just focusing on these core objects in the system, these individual unit pieces. It doesn't say anything about whether the whole system works. Most TDD proponents, I find, are much more focused on the unit level because that's where they're driving their design. And they're not very much focused on the system level of all, which is what people actually give a shit about. Does the system work? I don't care about whether your units work. Does the whole thing work? That's what matters. So that kind of freed my mind up a little bit. 
um, that if we give up this need for hard science experience, where we have to control all the variables and boil everything down to a single unit that can be tested, we can float freely with the world. Awesome. This realization, I came to realize, was why people hate fixtures. So fixtures in, in Rails is about spinning up a world. It's about setting up a sort of small-sized version of the whole world. Where most test approaches, they focus on just on the unit. I don't want to have an account in here and a project in here if I'm just testing my message. I just want to test on this one single thing, right? And if you're doing that, yeah, fixtures probably not a good thing. It doesn't really work for that. It works really well when you're not concerned about the hard science focus on, on your tests. It works really well um, when you focus on a larger level, when you focus on models, when you focus on controllers, and most importantly, when you're focused on systems. But all that is um, sort of usually swept away by the holy trinity of test metrics, coverage, ratio, and speed. I've been in a lot of internet arguments lately. Um, <laughs> in such esteemed establishments as Hacker News and, um, and elsewhere. And I find it really interesting because each individual argument will make me rage. But then the larger set of all arguments, like a meta study, actually reveals really interesting things about what people care about, what they value. And what I find is in most discussions about design, especially around Rails, what people care about are these things and these things only. It's about the test coverage, it's about the test ratio, and it's about how fast your tests run. Like, that's the pedestal. That's the holy grail. What actually happens underneath how the design of the rest of the application is, eh, doesn't really matter. And thus, a lot of people come to celebrate. Oh, I have a one to four test ratio. For every line of production code, I have four lines of test. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they say that with pride. And I'm like, what? So you're saying for every line of uh, production code you write, you have to write four lines of code? And that somehow makes you a hero? How, how does that work? So your system is now five times as large. Reasoning about the whole system is now five times as complex. And you're proud of this. Why? Well, of course. It's like, I'm 100% coverage. My 5,000 tests run incredibly fast because they never actually test very much. Uh, they certainly do not test the system. They test all these little slices of unit. Um, wonderful. Not wonderful. You have anemic fucking tests. They don't prove shit. You're going to have the same bug that we have on Basecamp, and the system is not going to work, even though you proudly proclaim that all your units are working. Well, whoopity do. This decoupling is not free. People think that, oh, this is like that uh, saying, like, quality is free, right? Testing is free. Not when you're doing it like this. It's not free. And most importantly, it's not free, not so much in time, but in conceptual overhead. Understanding a system that has been test-driven designed from the unit perspective is really hard. Because you have all these levels of indirection, you have all these levels of intermediation to separate the tests from slow things like HTML or the database or any of the other parts of the system that actually makes up your system. And they focus just on that one thing. Um, so they can be very fast if they don't have to work, if they don't actually have to test your system. So that's sort of two charges at once. It's the charge first that your design is not going to improve. Your design is going to deteriorate by going test first programming um, because you're going to construct your units of testing, your methods, in a different way, like we saw with the H example. You're going to inject all your dependencies in a way that does not improve things. Uh, and second of all, you're not going to get the benefit of great coverage. You might have a lot of tests, but they don't test your system. It doesn't uh, increase your confidence in actually the whole thing working. And then what good is it? Well, I thought about this for a long time and thought, like, this is not really doesn't seem like that great of a revelation. Why, why do I keep having these arguments over and over again? Why are people focused so hard and so intensely on this trinity of test metrics? How did that come to be the main thing 
that people are arguing about. How does that come to be the main decider of what's good design and what's bad design? Really couldn't really figure it out until I started thinking back of like, what is this prism we're looking through? We're looking through it, computer science, engineering, professionalism. James Harrington wrote a bunch of books on quality of engineering, and he has a, a great quote here. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. If you can't control it, you can't improve it. That makes a lot of sense. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that, that's gotta be why. And then I got another great quote. Just because you can, just because something is easy to measure doesn't mean it's important. That's, I think, is exactly what's going on here. Programming of information systems is a lot more like French poetry than it is like physics. But programmers grow up thinking that they're computer scientists, so they want it really badly to be like physics. They want it really badly to be a hard professional science. And coverage ratio and speed, you can get that fucking thing down to six decimals. Like that, I can be so precise about how fast my test runs, how much, 84.7% coverage, boom, got it. Doesn't say anything about whether that's actually important. Doesn't say anything about whether that's actually producing a good system. Doesn't say anything about whether the person after you or you yourself three months from now can understand what the hell is going on in this code base. You haven't necessarily made anything any clearer. You've made it very easy to produce metrics and if there's one thing we love with, with science, it's clear, concise, objective truths and coverage and ratio and speed fit that bill. So we adopted them with open arms, even though they were not that important. Second part of it, cost is not value. A lot of people have invested so much in building up their expertise, their time, their four to one ratio in tests, the investment is massive. Well, of course they're gonna be defensive about it. Like, you've invested so much of your ego and your time and your resources on this project into testing, so of course it must be valuable, of course it must be important. That's not how it works. Just because something is really expensive, just because something takes a lot of your time doesn't mean it's valuable, doesn't mean it's important. So, I was sort of giving a, a, a brief description of this talk yesterday at dinner with um, Aaron Patterson. And he trolled me right back and said, oh, TLDR, just don't test, right? Like, that's what I'm supposed to get out of this? No. No. Testing absolutely has value. Regression testing absolutely has value. Driving your design through test first in my mind, rarely has value. Not never. There are times where I'll write my test first, usually when it's something like a, um, a translator of some kind where I know exactly what's going in and I know exactly what I want out. That could be a good case to start with test first. Most information system design is not like that. I'm trying to figure out still what the system is supposed to do. Um, what I want to arrive at is a test it's a set of tests, it's a set of regression tests that make me feel good about that after the fact that I can still change my system and not break it, right? So, TDD, um, Kent Beck, main proponent behind TDD, has a very sensible quote that goes exactly along these lines. I get paid for code that works, not for tests, so my philosophy is to test as little as possible to reach a given level of confidence. Immensely sensible. And I find that that's actually often the case with these things that get taken too far. TDD started out as a pretty sensible thing. Kent has an even more sensible perception of it now, I think, than when he wrote the um, test driven book originally. Um, but that's not what most people take away. That's not what most people have run with if they wanted to build a career and making people feel shitty about their code bases and their dirty, dirty code. Um, they take a much more extremist approach that unless you're doing tests first, you are not a professional. Certainly not what Kent is saying. 
OK. So for me, this really boils down to we're, we're trying to wear the wrong hat the majority of the time. Thinking of yourself as a software engineer will lead you down the path of coverage, speed, metrics, hard sciences, all these things we can measure, and it leave you laughing at shit like interpretation of French poetry, of subjective evaluations of a design and a system, even though those are the only tools that we have. So this has taken me a while to arrive at this conclusion. I've hated the word software engineer for quite a while, because I never felt it fit me. I never thought of myself as a software engineer. I kind of tried to be one a few times, and I failed all the time. And by the time I finally arrived at programming as something that I wanted to do, it sure as shit wasn't software engineering. Yes, it's a hard hat that I wear occasionally when I do performance optimization. That's hard science. You make a change. You measure it. Was it an improvement? If not, revert. If yes, deploy. Very scientific. Very good. Great to wear the uh, hard hat when that fits. Is what, that what I do the majority of the time? Is that how I think of myself when I write most of the things that I write? When I add a new feature to Basecamp or do forensics to figure out how a bug came about or what somebody meant when they wrote a plugin or something? No, that's not what I do. So I don't try to think my, myself as a software engineer. OK. If we're not software engineers, most of the time when we make information systems, what are we then? What other hat should we try to wear? What other identity should we try to aspire to? I think we had it all along. I think we had it in language all along. We're software writers. Writing is a much more apt metaphor for what we do most of the time than engineering is. Writing is about clarity. It's about presenting information and motivations in a clear-to-follow manner um, such that anybody can understand it. There are not bonus points for making something convoluted, as there often is with engineering and with test-first design. Making things more convoluted give you the benefits of perhaps easier to test. They don't give you clarity. So those things are often in opposition. Clarity is all about being succinct without being terse. We can write things using as small words as we know how, using as little complication as we know how, using as little conceptual overhead as we know how to get the job done. That's a much better approach. And I think it comes very easy if you think of software development as writing. If you look at a piece of writing that somebody has written, and it's kind of convoluted, can't really follow the argument, and paragraphs are not broken up neatly, is the first thing you're going to say, do you know what the problem with this is? You're not using big enough words. If we just shove some bigger words into this text, it's going to be there. That's good. Oh, the problem here is like, like your sentences are too clear. Like if you just insert uh, a sentence in the middle, uh, that'd be great. Oh, do you know what? This needs more semicolons. That's what this needs. If this has more semicolons, boom, you've got clarity. No. More indirection, more third person. These are not the things that make for great, clear writing. And that's obvious when we talk about things like writing. So if we talk about software development as writing, I think it'll be obvious too. I think if we supplant the high ideal of what matters for design is how easy it is to test, how easy it is to make engineering driven, and put clarity of the code base above all else, we're going to be much better off. And arguments are going to be settled much easier. And it's going to be much easier to read the fucking code you wrote three months ago because you had that in mind. That was your motivation. That was what you were going for. So what is clarity? How do you figure that out, right? It's really easy to say, oh, yeah, just clarity. Boom. It's open to interpretation, right? It's not as clear as just saying, oh, if you can just get your code coverage above 85%, then you're gold. Right? Clarity doesn't work like that. There's not a metric we can just apply because, again, it's not hard science. Clarity of writing is not hard science. 
So the easy answer is I know it when I see it, right? There's not just going to be a list of principles and practices that somebody can be taught, and then they will automatically produce clear writing every time, right? If you want to be a good writer, is it enough just to sit and memorize a dictionary? No. Just knowing the words um, available to you, knowing the patterns of software development, is not going to make you a good developer. You have to develop an eye. You have to develop an eye for clarity, which means, first of all, you have to decide that that's important to you. So that's the first step. If you're still stuck in the most important thing about my system is how fast my tests run and how many of them I have, well, forget about it. You're not going to get to this point. You have to decide that the most important thing for your system is clarity. When you do decide that, you can start developing an eye. I started getting into photography maybe six years ago. When I first got into photography, like, I would look at a picture and say, oh, yeah, it looks like a good picture. Now, I've been looking at thousands of pictures, I've been taking thousands of pictures, and I've developed an eye. I can see when the white balance is off. I can see, oh, this has a blue tint. Oh, this actually, if we crop it just a little bit more, only the subjects we want to have in focus are in focus. Oh, this would actually be better in black and white. That eye just came from doing it a lot. It didn't come from just sitting down and reading a lot of photography books. And I think it's the same thing with code. I think a lot of programmers coming at it from a software engineering angle think that just all they have to do is learn the practices, um, learn the patterns, memorize them all, and then they will be good programmers. No, they won't. The only way to become a good programmer where, by definition, I define good program as somebody who program, who writes software with clarity, is to read a lot of software, write a lot of software. Just like how do you become a good photographer? You take a lot of pictures, and you look at them, and you practice, and you practice, and you practice. That's actually quite similar to the problem with diets, right? The fundamental truth with diets is to be healthy, well, you should probably exercise regularly, you should probably eat a reasonable amount, and it should be good stuff. Like, that's three things. Incredibly hard to do. Most people do not do that, right? Figuring out how to write good software, read a lot of software, write a lot of software, um, aim for clarity. It sounds too simple. Why is it simple? Because there's not just a secret. There's not just one answer somebody can give you. Um, the only way you can get there is by doing it. So. When I first started developing Rails, I read a ton of software. I read the entire Ruby standard library, partly because documentation of Ruby at that time was pretty poor, and the only way to figure out how it worked was to actually look at code. But that was also where I learned so much. Today, we have it so much easier. Bundle, open, name of any gem, and it'll open, boom, right up in your text editor. You can look at any code. How many of you have read through a complete gem recently? Something you did not write? Awesome. That's actually really encouraging. I thought it would be much less. I think that is exactly the path you need to take. You need to read a shit ton of code. And it's not so much just because you read this code and then, oh, that's all great stuff. Um, just as important as it is to, to develop your sense of writing by reading a lot of shit writing, so is it with code. And I think you'll find that that is actually very easy, because a lot of things you'll do bundle open on will follow Sturgeon's revelation. 90% <laughs> of everything is crap. Um, well, at least you know you have company if you write crap software, and I certainly do from time to time. Um, and that's a great way to learn. I actually find that I learned the most about software. I learned the most about what matters to me. I learned the most about what clarity is when I read poor software. Because what I do is I take a piece of software, I take a class or method, and then I look at, how good is Puclera? Like, this is, I think this is poorly written. I think this smells. Um, how can I rewrite it? So by just sitting down and going through that exercise and rewriting it, I find I learn a whole lot about what I care about. So that's what I've been doing lately. Uh, engaging in a lot of these internet arguments. Somebody will submit a piece of code, and usually the 
submission will come along with the proposed solution too, right? I had this shitty piece of code, then I learned about these three patterns, and now it's wonderful. And what I have found every single time, and I've only done this maybe a handful of times, maybe a little more, is that every single time, you just took the shitty code and you stuck it into some different boxes. Like, it didn't actually improve. Applying the pattern to it did not improve the underlying clarity of the code because you just wrote it poorly. Like, the problem with the code was not that it was missing patterns. The problem with the code was that it was crap. That it just had to be rewritten. Now, that leads us to sort of a mission, in some ways, for what Rails is and what Ruby is. And it leads also to clarify some of the arguments we've had in the Rails community for a while. Readability is incredibly important to Ruby. We have a lot of duplicated methods that do exactly the same thing just so we can improve readability. I remember the first time I saw unless when I was learning about Ruby. That was one of those light bulb moments. It's like, wait a minute, unless is exactly the same as if not, but it's a different keyword. Huh. Right? It was not just about making the most e efficient, compact language. It was about readability. <laughs> Mind blown. And decade-long love affair with Ruby established. And I think that this is what we're trying to achieve constantly in Rails as well. A lot of people will gripe about, oh, active record is too big, or something is too big, or have too many methods, or the surface area is too big, or there's whatever it is, right? Like, who gives a shit? Is it more readable? Is it more clear? That's the only thing that matters. What do I care whether the surface area of a method is 100 methods or it's 200 methods? I don't give a shit about that. The only thing I give a shit about is whether is the code I'm actually reading, is the system I'm trying to understand, is that more clear? When you put clarity as your number one mission, a lot of concerns just fall by the wayside. It just doesn't matter anymore. And it's liberating. So I think this actually comes from sort of the same root. I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. I think that describes about 80% of all that 90% of shitty code. Most people did not take the time to write a short piece of code, so they wrote a long one instead. And then they wrote that long one piece of code, and they like pulled out their suspenders and like, oh yeah, I'm done. My tests pass. Boom. Right? Or they look at it and say, like, oh shit, this is too long. I must be missing some patterns. If I just sprinkle some patterns over this, wonders, right? No. What you wrote was a draft. This was just the first draft, right? Any piece of code you write down is just a draft. Um, Mark Twain actually had the hard job, right? He wrote in ink. If you actually had to change that, well, that was kind of hard, right? So his drafts were a lot more complicated. Ours, we have it so easy. A text editor, you just delete stuff. You don't need any of this little stuff that you, you fill over the page and you spill it everywhere and so forth. Eraser, um, you can just delete stuff. Like that's my favorite key, the delete key. It's the number one tool for improving code. Delete key. So, uh, when I was in high school, um, I submitted a bunch of first drafts as essays, and they were really shitty. And of course they were. They were the first draft. And my teacher at the time said. Well, all right, all right, this is, this is actually not bad. You just only did step one. If you have something on your mind, you should write it down. That's what I did. I, I wrote it down, and then I handed it in. Oh, if you have written something down, you should rewrite it. Oh, that was the step I missed. And I think that's the step most people miss when they write down code. Because they're focused on all these other things. They're not focused on the clarity. Because when you are focused on the clarity, you will realize that all your first drafts are terrible. All my first drafts are terrible. All my first attempts at writing a good class are poor. They're too long. They're not at the same level of abstraction. They're not clear. And that's OK. I wrote something down. I was trying to figure out what the system was supposed to do. That's hard work. And oftentimes, you don't get perfect code out of that when you're still trying to figure out what it is that you're writing. Um, but once you've written it down, you should rewrite it. 
And I think the key part of rewriting is omitting needless words when it comes to regular writing. When it comes to programming, it's omitting needless concepts, it's omitting needless patterns, it's omitting needless practices, it's omitting needless classes, it's omitting all these extra things that aren't getting you closer to clarity, right? How do you know? You develop an eye for it. How do you develop an eye? You read a lot of code, you write a lot of code, you rewrite a lot of code, and you forget about fucking patterns for a while. You forget about fucking TDD for a while. And you focus on just what's in front of you. The piece of code, how can I write it simpler? Write software well. Thank you very much. <laughs>